Hello, fellow peacemakers. Welcome to episode 33 of Make Peace Not Beef. I am so pumped for today's episode because, first of all, we have a returning guest, Alicia, who previously reviewed A Life on a Planet by Sir David Attenborough. If you didn't see it, that was episode 18, uh, where we did a movie review. Fantastic movie, by the way. And today we're actually going to do a movie review for Seaspiracy, one of the most highly anticipated movies of 2021. And in addition to Alicia, we have uh, one new member joining the gang today. And his name is Scott, who is, I believe, an ecotoxicologist working for the government of California. He's also a research scientist and environmentalist. But I'm not going to steal his thunder and I'm going to let him introduce himself in a bit and definitely stick around for this episode it's going to be loaded with information you're going to learn a shit ton about not just the oceans but also you know the fishing industry we're going to expose so many things that are going to absolutely blow your mind let me just start off by saying that was fucking incredible this is not anything i would have imagined if anything was closer to a thriller like Watching Seaspiracy, I was just stunned by all the things that, that I did not know that was going on that was feeding the, the fishing industry. So this movie was effectively a, an expose for me. So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to first let my two lovely guests introduce themselves. Why don't we start off with Alicia since she's the returning guest. Welcome, Alicia. So yeah, my name is Alicia and I'm a DevOps engineer here in Colorado. I work in like the machine learning AI industry. Yeah, fun fact about myself is I recently um, came back from doing volunteer work in Puerto Rico for the Peregrine Fund, where we did some research for for different hawk species on the island. Awesome, Alicia. And welcome back. How do you feel second time around on the show? Yeah, I'm super excited. This is another um, really good film and yeah, I can't wait to discuss it. And can I just first comment quickly? Alicia looks freaking amazing today. She just got her <laughs> hair done. Seriously, like loving, loving the, the, the curl, the wave. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I love your hair. You look, you look fabulous. You always do, but t- today you're like up a notch. <laughs> yeah, well, w- welcome back to Make Peace Not Beef. Excited to have you for another round of movie review. I feel like you're going to be a returning guest for all these movie reviews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. And I now I want to pass on the mic on to Scott. Go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Lily. My name is Dr. Scott Coffin. I'm a research scientist here at the California State Water Resources Control Board, which is a mouthful. So you can just call it the State Water Board or just the government of California if it's easier. I did a PhD. PhD in marine ecotoxicology with a focus on plastic pollution and how it affects humans and aquatic organisms, fish and birds and worms and all of the other species. Uh, right now, I'm studying microplastics and how they affect our health. And a fun fact about me, uh, I actually lived in Puerto Rico for a semester. I studied Spanish and uh, marine biology there uh, many years ago. Wow, that's amazing. So Alicia is actually a Boricua, right? She, yeah. So you oh. speak Spanish. Um, like, I'm, I'm learning Spanish. Um, but yeah, learning, I have family. you're Puerto in, Rican. <laughs> yes, I am Puerto Rican. I have family in Puerto Rico. Um, and yeah, when I did the volunteer work, I also did visit some family. So now when I go visit family, I can also do volunteer work each time I go. So lovely and and scott has just recently been to uh he's he's lived in puerto rico you said i did and i fell in love with the food there alicia do you have a favorite puerto rican dish uh mafungo <laughs> oh yeah yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> should we okay. do it should we do a separate episode on like puerto rico travel tips you want to get you two to come back <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah you know, restaurants to visit um what is the capital city of puerto rico i'm so like someone um, someone there we go. Is that where you both stayed at? I know my family is in Ajuntas. It's a uh, almost like three hours south of of San Juan, and that's where the volunteer work I did was also at in Ajuntas. Quick question: Is is J Lo Puerto Rican? Yeah. See, I was like thinking in my head, I'm like I knew one of one of those. Like, yeah, I just knew someone <laughs> that I really admired was Puerto Rican. It was J Lo. No wonder. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that was really random, but I'm just like, I knew it. <laughs> Jenny from the block. Oh, I was just going to clarify for those listeners that don't know what mofongo is and are curious now. It is a plantain dish that has been cooked in several different ways, multiple times. It takes a very long time to make. And if you ask a Puerto Rican to make it for you, uh, they'll probably refer you to like their grandmother who does it much better than they could. It's a bit of a confounding dish, honestly, because the texture is like jello, but the flavor is like 
potato chips, but it's like sweet. What? I don't know if I'm describing it yeah, very I, well. <laughs> Alicia, <laughs> fill in the so, gap here. Yeah, it's um like mashed plantains that are boiled so that they're soft and then they're like fried and then mashed together into like a shape or like, like, like a bowl that you can fill with like cooked meats or vegetables or shrimp. And then that goes in the bowl. Wait a second, I'm plantain. having... I'm having a very hard time picturing that. So he said the texture is like jelly, but it tastes like chips. How is that even possible? How can you get something crispy and soft at the same time? Wait, what is what is this dish called? I need to look it up. Mofongo. I think it's M O F O N G O. I think that's right. Mofongo. M O F O N G O. Okay, listeners, pause this video. Go look up mofongo. Oh, that just looks like mashed potatoes. But it's crispy. <laughs> yeah, it's like fried. Like what? How can it be crispy? But it's it's mashed though, isn't it? It's like crispy bits, so... but then smashed together to make a shape. Whoa. Yeah. And it's like it's like boiled. So the think of it more as like a potato than a banana. That's like that more like a plantain and it's like soft, but also kind of crispy. I am learning new things on this <laughs> podcast episode. Supposedly talk about sea spiracy, but now I'm learning new Puerto Rican dishes now that I need to try. That's interesting. So it's fried plantains. Uh, that are mashed with salt, garlic, broth, and olive oil in a wooden, what's a pilong? Pylon. Um, it's like a mortar and pestle. Interesting. Yeah. This is very, very cool. Yeah. So you like smash it like a, like, in like a mortar and pestle. So you just kind of like pound it so that it's not lumpy. <laughs> very interesting okay well uh fun fact about puerto rico guys <laughs> 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 gotta go try some mofongo when you're there yeah anyway shall we get into today's episode and talk about this movie that was a, that was a hell of a movie seaspiracy which has been mm-hmm. making headlines everywhere in the news since its release right not sure about youtube but i've i've just spent a shit ton of my time on clubhouse uh, since like march this year and the moment the movie was released, there was like a billion clubhouse rooms discussing Seaspiracy, mostly among the vegan community, but there were just so much controversy around the film. Um, like non-vegans were also talking about it. But without spoiling the film too much, I just want to quickly talk about what the movie is about for those of you who haven't watched Seaspiracy yet. First of all, I highly, highly recommend this movie. The, the production was freaking amazing. And the film was actually produced by the same producer, uh, Kip Anderson, the same guy that made that directed Cowspiracy and What the Health. It's, it's kind of obvious that he's he's like a he's a vegan proponent but that's not the point all of his films kind of have this underlying theme of being very very much you know based in uh, like grounded in science and evidence which i really really appreciate and in this film the director was actually um ali tabrizi i believe he is is he a iranian british yeah i'm, I'm not familiar I, with, I could be wrong um, but he's he's british yeah so basically ali um sort of went on this journey to investigate the the truth behind the fishing industry. You know, he went around the world, right? Like he, in the movie, he visited places such as, you know, Iceland, Liberia, uh, Thailand, and then also Denmark in the end, and sort of just kind of really did a deep dive on what was really going on behind the, the fishing industry. And, you know, the results were just so uh, staggering. So, yeah, I don't want to spoil too much, but let, let's... Let's get into it. So I, I think the most important t- key takeaway from this film is that the, the way fishing is done around the world, there are uh, some major problems with it, right? Number one is the amount of bycatch that is involved in fishing as a byproduct, of course, of fishing that significantly reduces biodiversity and has driven you know sharks and whales to extinction. And for those of you who don't know what a bycatch is, a by- bycatch is basically catching anything that is not the primary target in the process of fishing. So for example, you're trying to fish, but you end up catching a bunch of whales and dolphins and purposes in the process, right? And the, the film claims that over 300,000 whales and dolphins are killed every year as bycatch of industrial fishing. And as you may or may not know, whales play a huge role in ocean carbon sequestration because whales actually help fertilize uh, phytoplankton and phytoplankton are actually the ones that absorb uh, carbon dioxide in the, in the ocean. So this is a huge problem. The fact that we're killing so many dolphins as bycatch of fishing. And then also this, this really shocked me. 50 million sharks were killed per year as, as bycatch and shark populations have declined by 70% since we've started industrial fishing. And then that's, that's the first problem, right? Bycatch and like reduce 
marine biodiversity, biodiversity. The second biggest problem that the film touched on was the amount of ocean plastic associated with industrial fishing. And it claims that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is like this vortex in the Great Pacific that is three times the size of France, 46% of all of the ocean plastic accumulated in that area is due to fishing nets and fishing gear, which it claims to be far more dangerous than plastic straws and plastic bags. So basically it's saying that, you know, the fishing industry is responsible for a huge percentage of that plastic garbage in the ocean. And then it sort of dives into all the ethical issues associated with industrial fishing, right? You know, organized crime, syndicates, mafia. And then it kind of, a part of the film, you know, the the director goes to countries such as Somalia and Liberia and sort of um, investigates all these uh, illegal trawlers. And it talks about how every one in three fishes that is imported into the United States is actually illegally caught. And it sort of discusses sort of like other issues, you know, including huge amount of subsidies that go into the fishing industry, which could have been used to solve world hunger. And then he also goes to places like Thailand and just, and sort of makes that comparison between blood diamonds and blood shrimp blood trim farms. Sorry, I've spoken a lot. I do want to, of course, give my guests the opportunity to pitch in on what they thought of the film, but I just wanted to give an overview for our audience who hasn't watched Seaspiracy yet. So why don't we go in order? So let's start off with Alicia. How did you, what did you think of this film? And, you know, how did it make you feel? Yeah. Well, yeah, the film was very shocking. I felt like I never thought of commercial fishing in that way ever before. Also, maybe I never questioned the labels saying that this was sustainably caught. I just kind of saw that and maybe thought that that was better or like, I mean, they they put it on there and make it look big. So you are drawn towards it. So it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, this is better for the environment to buy this versus that. Yeah. I guess like, I just didn't really think about these things too much until I saw the film and that it was really shocking. And I was like, wow, like I would like to make some change and take some action to make the oceans better because there's definitely things that we can do to improve the overall health of the oceans right and what about you scott yeah i felt pretty similarly it it reminded me of the first time that i learned about a lot of the issues around meat uh, uh, land meat and just being shocked at a lot of the the issues that had not been communicated much in mainstream media and other other places and I felt like the overall narrative that we need to think more about where our food comes from and the sustainability of it is an undercommunicated message for the ocean. And I felt like that was a huge, hugely impactful part of the film that whether or not a lot of the things are accurate, I think the overall Mm -hmm. message stuck and it made an impact. And it's really just the start of a conversation that is well overdue. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've actually done quite a bit of research after the movie, to your point, right? Like vetting the facts. And I've followed a couple of you know academic papers. And I would say for the large part, the statistics were accurate and they are grounded in science. And one of the astounding claims that the film makes is actually that by the year 2048, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean. And the way that we currently go about fishing simply isn't sustainable. And the film actually went to, you know, speak to one of the ocean oceanographers, I, I believe her name was so- Sylvia Earle, on the topic, and they asked the oceanographer, is there such thing as sustainable fishing? To which she said, large-scale extraction of wildlife simply cannot be sustainable. And then she said, there's no such thing as sustainable fishery. So yeah, Alicia and Scott, how do you feel about that? I think that's true. <laughs> After watching the film and like, there's just There's no like ocean police out there, like ensuring that something is done correctly or incorrectly and just how commercial fishing is done with like large nets that just catch everything. Like that's not sustainable. So we'd have to change the way we do that or just stop altogether. Yeah, absolutely. And what you just said, which is, you know, with those large, like catching fishes with those large nets, I think Mm -hmm. the process is called trawling right? Where you kind of have this massive net, which has the capacity to destroy a cathedral. That was the claim that the movie made. Mm -hmm. This massive net sort of sailing behind the ship that kind of just catches everything in the ocean all at once. You know, a lot of that is probably just bycatch. And trawlers produce a huge amount of carbon emissions, right? Because these, these are just like gigantic nets, that are just trawling through the ocean and they kind of disturb the surroundings, you know, and, and stir up the waters as it goes through the ocean. And this is a huge problem. Um, Seafloor as well. Absolutely. Just disturbing yeah. all the wildlife around it, right? Imagine all these schools mm-hmm. of fishes just having to, you know, escape and just, just causing like wreaking havoc on the oceans. And yeah, Scott, what about you? So 
I think there's definitely gradients of sustainability for fishing. Based on my research, there's there have been instances throughout history where we've demonstrated that sustainable fishing can exist in certain instances when it's well regulated. So for for example, the Gulf of Mexico for many years was effectively unregulated and fishermen could take as much as they could get and they saw dramatic declines in fish mm-hmm. populations over year to year and mm-hmm. it was actually the fishermen that came together and said we're not we don't have any fish we don't have any product mm-hmm. left yeah. it's hard to get it and so they were actually advocating for some level of regulation and what they found what the marine biologists found is that there is a certain limit that you can take from the population that doesn't take away from the overall productivity of that system and that level is dependent on a lot of different factors but it should be done scientifically and if you once they implemented a catch limit uh, mm-hmm. on on the total ecosystem, the whole, the whole Gulf of, of Mexico, they saw a rebound of a lot of these, these fish stocks that were nearly uh, decimated. So I'm not saying that it's not possible for sustainable fishing. I, 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 th- I think that that point, it, it lacked the nuance that I see in a, in a lot of the conversations with marine biologists. Right. So ideally, you know, everybody would respect these regulations. But one of the really salient points that the movie pointed out was the reality of illegal fishing, because what happens is when you place a cash limit here, the fishermen are going to venture out into other seas and start stealing fishes elsewhere, right? Which is why the movie made the claim that every one in three imported fishes in the United States is illegally caught and therefore illegally sold. And the really interesting scene in the movie that they talked about, well, there was two. First, what were these, you know, um, pirates in Somalia, right? And then it was how on the West Coast, like on the West African coast, specifically in Liberia, I think that's that's where the director went. He kind of followed the Sea Shepherd, which is this marine wildlife conservation organization, a, a nonprofit that basically is, combats illegal fishing. And they caught so many of these illegal Chinese trawlers that were basically, you know, illegally catching fishes um, in the Liberian waters, which sort of forced these younger Liberian fishermen to venture out further into the sea where the waters were gushing and it was it was just very dangerous for them to go out there without life vests. So forcing these local fishermen to venture out into the sea because they cannot compete with these commercial fishing larger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they can't compete with the commercial yeah fishing vessels and they're Correct. catching all of their food and exactly. they're either forced to go further out or go further inland and eat bush meat and kill animals. Exactly. Because like when you think about sovereignty of ocean, it's not clear cut, right? So when you say mm-hmm. I'm going to place a catch limit on the number of fishes we catch, how do you enforce that though? Like Scott, what do you think? Right. I, I think it is clearly a, a tragedy of the commons, just like many other these global issues that we've encountered, climate change, for example. Um, it, it's in really what, what you're talking about going to other people's waters or other other waters that may or may not be one nation's that's a form of colonialism Mm -hmm. and i think we need to have an international convention on that i mean we we have had international conventions on marine uh, issues for many many decades it's called the marpol a marine policy and there's been many binding treaties that have been signed by countries that have had it, uh, positive impacts uh, on, on the marine ecosystem. For instance, uh, Marpol Annex 5 banned ships from putting plastic into the ocean back in 1988, and it was signed by 150 countries. And the monitoring data that has just come out in the past year has shown that actually it had a, a dramatic impact on the amount of plastic that we've seen in the ocean, uh, looking back at historic historic measurement. And I think the problem is always going to be enforcement. We can set these goals, and some countries will follow them, because they are dutiful and they have good intentions, but other countries will see that as an opportunity to break the rules because others are allowing it, uh, allowing a a resource basically to be given up to them. And so there is no really international police, it seems, that is enforcing this like you would want there to be similar to the um, the Sea Shepherd. I mean, that's that's sort of renegade, right? Uh, But you'd you'd expect there to be something like that that's more uh, official, if you will. Right. Once again, there's no such thing as international law, to your point. But in one of the scenes in the movie, there was a Filipino inspector. I'm not sure if you remember it. She was being murdered for, you know, doing her job. Right. Like if you remember like 
like you said, she was patrolling and to make sure that, you know, all these fishermen were abiding by the rules, but she was murdered. And in that moment, I was like, holy crap, even the people who are standing up for justice are being vindicated. So like in that sense, I guess there is no justice in this industry where, where, because like you said, there is no governing body or anyone to oversee this. And because the ocean is such a large space, it's just so hard to enforce that. Right. And I, I feel like in an ideal world, yes, we would do this, but right now, because everybody is trying to overfish and you know, if you place a catch limit over here, they're going to venture out into foreign waters and, and go about illegal fishing. And then that's going to cause their fish stock to decline. So right now we're seeing a steady decline until we reach a point where the where the marine population cannot rebound. And we're going to get to a place where there's no fishes left in the ocean. And that's what they're that's what they're saying. But another major problem, especially in Asia, and, and this part I think is I, I think the listeners need to know because I think this was one of the most shocking scenes in the movie. I'm not sure if you remember, there was a scene, if you recall, where the director made a comparison between blood diamonds, right, in Sierra Leone versus the blood shrimp farms in Southeast Asia. And he kind of made the comparison because slavery is involved in shrimp, shrimp farms and Thailand is known for producing, like mass producing shrimps. And so he went to Bangkok and Thailand and he had to pixelate the faces of the slaves, uh, because they could get killed if the slave owners found out that they were disclosing this information to a filmmaker, right? And I was just so shocked to learn about the physical abuse of slaves, that they were threatened with guns and, and that the slave owners killed, you know, the, the fishermen who did not obey and their corpses were dumped into the ocean and these young men were trapped on these fishing boats and they could just never go home. And it's crazy to think that back before I became vegan, that the shrimp that I was enjoying could have come from one of these places and that, you know, where people are being enslaved and killed. So how did you feel about that, Scott? I mean, that was incredibly shocking and really sad. And I mean, that that is something that should be banned for import into any developed country that has uh, an ethic code and really any country in the world i mean that should be banned but there's very little accountability there's the whole supply chain is not it doesn't have oversight and this is a problem with basically any globalized trade plastic pollution clothing fast fashion chemicals meat i mean land meat basically everything you can't trace True. the many steps that it gets to you between the, the actual source where it's grown and and to the final consumer uh, even the businesses often don't know where they you know every every person who's touched the product along their way and i i think we need we need more international collaboration on all fronts well let me ask you a question then so let's say you went to the supermarket and you saw and you saw um you know, in the in the frozen section, shrimp imported from Thailand. Now, would you buy that or not? If that was your only option? In a scenario where I eat fish, I would probably look up information on it. Uh, there's a, a, an app by the Monterey Bay that puts out information. The sources, uh, you know, if it's, you can, you can type in the type, the exact type of fish species that you're eating, and it'll tell you, you know, if it's caught with this device in this area, it's probably bad. And oh. then it has, you know, a, a scale of like F, both ethics as well as the environmental impact. That was an app that I used for a really long time back when I lived in Puerto Rico and was wow. like eating fish all the time, but I haven't used it in a while. It's a, it's a great resource. Hold on. Are you, are you vegan by any chance? Now I'm mostly vegan. I mean, I eat eggs and cheese, but I used to be hardcore vegan for a while. So you, you stopped eating fish. So I assumed you ate fish, meat, everything. I did not know. That you've stopped. Um, I used to eat fish, but I haven't eaten fish for a while. And why is that? Uh, before sea spiracy, I I was it was actually due to the, the chemical pollution. A marine ecotoxicologist, you learn a lot about biomagnification. Yeah. And one of the crazy statistics that I learned in my first year ecotox class was that mercury bioaccumulates in tuna at levels that if you were to eat one serving of tuna per month, you would be already exceeding your acceptable in uh, intake of mercury. And that that was just, that was it for me. There's, there are certainly some fish that don't biomagnify because they're, they don't have a lot of fat and the fat is really the determinant factor for a lot of chemicals uh, that I would probably eat. But that learning about that sort of just like killed my enthusiasm in a lot of ways. Right, right. Oh. And and Alicia, go for it. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that. So it has to do with the amount of fat that a fish has Pastors. determines how much chemical pollutants they can store in their body. So there's there's two factors actually that determine at least uh, I would say like 90% of the chemicals that we care about. It's the fat and how high up they are in the food chain. So the the, the more 
fish they have, and the more species they have below them that they're eating, trophic levels, the more bioaccumulation possible. So a trophic, uh, a high trophic level animal, like a like an apex predator, like a shark, super fatty, and they're like you know five or six levels mm -hmm. up on the food chain, they're going to be incredibly contaminated. I would never eat shark, no matter where it's come from. Whereas something on the very bottom of the food chain, like algae, um, there's virtually no accumulation going on and they're not fatty at all. So, I mean, I would like the, the, the seafood alternatives that they talk about in Seaspiracy that are made of the bottom trophic level. I think that is likely to be sustainable ad infinitum if we do it correctly, uh, much like eating anything else from the bottom of the food chain terrestrially, right? Exactly. Same thing with land animals. I was just going to say like the higher up in the food chain, the more chemicals, toxins, steroids, antibiotics, you know, accumulate. And I actually talked about bio amplification, Alicia, I'm not sure if you remember in A Life on Our Planet, I talked about how, you know, bio amplification is a real concern is for those who eat okay. seafood, right? Like the larger fishes eat the smaller fishes and the smaller fishes eat the even smaller fishes. So by the time it gets to you and you're at the apex of the hierarchy, you're, you have high concentrations of uh, heavy metals and toxic chemicals in your body. And I think scientists have conducted, I, I believe I, I heard this on Joe Rogan, actually, he interviewed an eco toxicologist a while ago, I forgot his name, but he talked Talked about how he found traces of, I, I think, mercury or arsenic in Eskimo women who were breastfeeding, right? Very high levels. Yeah, we often see very high levels in the Arctic because PCBs uh, oh, accumulate PCBs. in yes. the poles. They right, actually you, put, uh, you find oh. higher concentrations where, like, thousands of miles from where the pollution is than where you actually see the pollution yeah the source of the pollution so yeah scott if you don't mind explaining what pcbs are and why they accumulate in the arctic that'd be great sure so pcbs are polychlorinated biphenyls and they are one of the most toxic and persistent chemicals that humans have ever created and back in the uh, i believe it was the 60s or the 70s there was an international convention where Virtually every country in the world agreed, we're never going to make these things again because they just don't belong in the world in any circumstance. But before that, they were used in many, many, many applications. Predominantly, they were used in transformers, like electrical transformers. If you walk around your neighborhood and see those like green boxes, you'll see no PCB. There'll be like a little label on it. Effectively, they're banned, but you still find them every once in a while uh, being made still. But the reason that they're in the Arctic more than in the equatorial zones where a lot of the pollution was actually discharged into the ocean is a an interesting effect called the snow globe effect and effectively what it is is these pcbs some of them are quite volatile so whether they're in the ocean whether they're on land wherever they will eventually turn into a gaseous state mm -hmm. and enter the atmosphere and fall down back onto the atmosphere from rain or uh, just changing pressures and then they will do that again and again and again and again and again and again and the natural currents of the globe is that uh, any type of particle water particle or anything will eventually make its way up to the arctic and then become ice it's a it's a distillation uh, mm -hmm. mechanism and that's why we find so many PCBs or such high levels uh, up in the Arctic. And once they're up there, you have animals that are really fatty, like oh, yeah. elephant seals, polar, mm -hmm. polar bears, mm -hmm. and they're, they live long lives too. So they're accumulating these toxicants, oh, which PCBs in particular are highly bioaccumulative. They bind to fat really, really well. Mm -hmm. And you, you often find high levels in Eskimo populations. Mm -hmm. You also find levels at, in fish in certain countries that would be really concerning. I recently saw a risk assessment for the Philippines, right. a very particular town in the Philippines that they were looking at not only what's in the fish, but also the blood concentrations of people that eat the fish. And they were alarmingly high. Some concentrations you would never find in developed nations because we would effectively go to those markets and say, you can't serve this fish. This is a, this is a toxic food. But a lot of these countries don't have those regulations or the option. I mean, that's that's what they have left. Pescatarians, take notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alicia, go for it. So these PCBs, they're like they're banned now, but they'll forever be on our planet. Like they don't ever biodegrade or anything. They're just 
moving around always um effectively forever yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, they, they degrade on the scale of you know thousands to i think hundreds of thousands of years so within human time scales like forever yeah Damn it. It's a real serious issue. And for those of you who are like, you know, you you love seafood, I mean, for the taste, it's really time to reconsider that for your own health. Because like you said, these toxic chemicals and, and you know, heavy metals end up in our fat stores, right? I think. And they're there for life. And there's a lot of times passed from mother to child. And the moment I learned that, well, I was I was already vegan by the time I learned about all this. So I'm like, thank God I went vegan, you know, also for ethical reasons, but also from a health and environmental standpoint, like eating fish is probably one of the worst things you can do to your body, right? I think it depends on the fish. It's it's a, given it's, the current global climate. And- well, actually, I mean, there, there are certain types of fish that have very, very low fat reserves that you wouldn't expect to find heavy metals or PCBs or other hydrophobic contaminants. And if they're sourced from areas with relatively low pollution, then they're probably more healthy than harmful uh, in most instances. But you brought up a good point, which is that through the ocean currents, it kind of carries all this pollution everywhere around the globe. So I, is there any place in the world where that is untouched by pollution? <laughs> uh, you can always find traces of any chemical anywhere effectively, especially exactly. these that never go away. But, but I mean, there's there's places that have fish that are are fine for human consumption. There's a lot of the fish that is served in U.S. markets probably has very low concentrations of PCBs because it's regulated. They monitor, they have to do peri- uh, periodic monitoring to ensure that they're not at toxic levels. But these populations are declining too, right? Because of overfishing. So I feel like, especially with such a booming demand for seafood, which is why I am a huge proponent of Seaspiracy and its messaging, which is that we need to switch to plant-based alternatives, you know, with plant-based fish and salmon, you know, made from probably, I don't know, kelp seaweed that, that still have that seafood taste without the, you know, the animal flesh. I think that is really important because as the movie said, we're the ocean, we're going to run out of fish. You know, there's not an infinite supply of fishes, which is what I feel like modern economy sort of banking on that there's an infinite supply of resources, infinite supply of food, which is just not true. No, <laughs> guys, the reality is we are running out of resources and we're depleting them at, at an extremely fast rate, uh, more so than they, they can recuperate and regenerate, which is why the fish populations around the world, not just fishes, right, but also bycatch like dolphins, whales, they're all declining and they each of them play a key role in in our ecosystem and sustaining the livelihood of biodiversity. So once you start removing all these keystone species, guess what? (laughs) We are effectively removing ourselves from the food chain at some point. (laughs) Yeah. And like, also like from a health standpoint too, like the fish get their omega-3s from algae. So you can just take algae supplements or I guess like algae (laughs) Um, if that's available. (laughs) So yeah, that's also like a really good alternative to get your omega-3s in. Such a good point. Most people don't know. They think omega-3 comes from salmon and fish and it's because it's called yeah, fish oil. I thought that too. <laughs> I thought that too for many years, but no, it's actually extracted from algae, which is why I actually mm-hmm. have algal oil supplement at home because that's where the omega-3 actually comes from. So yeah, Scott, yeah. you want to add to that? Well, it's the same as vitamin B12, right? The animals don't mm-hmm. produce the vitamin B12, it's the bacteria. So Correct. you can get vitamin B12 from your home garden if you have organic produce, just don't wash it. There's your B12. <laughs> Yeah, it is so true. Whenever, I mean, same with technically protein, animals get their protein from plants. So, I mean, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, why, why are we eating all the middlemen? Why don't we just eat the direct source? That way we mm-hmm. can bypass, you know, all this animal agriculture, same with seafood, right? And, and why are we stealing their gains? <laughs> exactly. Why are we stealing their gains? I agree. <laughs> But back to the movie Seaspiracy, though. So, you know, we talked about whether or not there is such thing as sustainable fishing. So I guess Scott says, you know, under the circumstances that these regulations are actually properly enforced, we could. But I would argue that in, in the real world, there is no such thing as sustainable fishing because humans are greedy as fuck. And because of that, we either overfish or we are going to venture into other people's territories and steal their fish. So eventually, I mean, think about it. Think about in the future where there's going to be a freshwater scare, like uh, a scarcity of fresh water. Then eventually countries are going to, you know, go into wars and they're going to fight for the last drop of water on this planet. Right. So I'm just thinking instead of, you know, because we know where this world is headed with the way that we currently assume with fish, animal agriculture. Why don't we why don't we make that transition now? So because we all know like the projections are clear, you know, by 2050, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean. So why don't we make that switch now and allow 
you know, the marine ecosystem to regenerate itself while we still have the chance. So Scott, what are, what are your views on that? Are you optimistic that we can regenerate if we significantly reduce our consumption of fish? Absolutely. The ocean, the ocean is incredibly responsive. It's one of the fastest systems in the world. Unlike terrestrial systems where you have, it takes many years to replenish the nutrients in the soils. The ocean can happen year to year. You can see dramatic differences. And so if we were to stop fishing entirely as a population, the oceans would rebound very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, we, we have seen that through many years of data where we've actually implemented a lot of these regulations, like I mentioned, the Gulf of Mexico. But I think if we want to be more realistic, equitable, I think we should consider relative contributions mm -hmm. and relative action. So mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think the uh, the message of the film for the majority of people that viewed it, which is a lot of the Western culture, is is great. Stop eating meat or stop or reduce your fish consumption. But if you were to go to the three billion people in the world that get 20% of their protein from Japan. seafood mm -hmm. and try and tell them that, well that's their way of life. And good yeah. luck trying to change their minds on that. Also what's the alternative? So I think equity needs to be more forefront in the conversation. Now that we have your attention, you care about this. Okay, now how to, let's take it to the next step, which is let's let's not ruin this opportunity or ruin this this, this uh, food source for many people in the world that already depend on it. Absolutely. And you brought up such a great point. And I totally agree with that, right? I think for those of us who are privileged enough to make the switch to a plant-based diet, we should. That is pretty much all of America. Uh, I live in Canada, you know, uh, probably all the, the nations in Europe, at least Northern Europe, right? Countries like Germany, you know, who are very well off. But you're right, those indigenous populations who thrive on, you know, seafood, I think, yes, they have the right to. And we should preserve the last bit of the fish populations for them. Also countries like Japan. But interesting how you brought that up because there is a recent Japanese startup. I believe they're called OmniFoods. I read it recently in an article that, that are now pioneering plant-based seafood. Alternative. And it's a booming industry in Asia right now, because I think the Japanese are starting to realize this is a problem as well. So they're definitely pivoting. And I mean, obviously, you know, with what Beyond Meat is doing and Impossible Foods, we're already making that switch for land animals, which I think is freaking fantastic. But now there's more startups also in the States now producing uh, plant-based lobsters and seafood. So I'm super excited for that. I think we definitely need to make that switch. I agree. Alicia? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like we definitely have all the options available to us to do these things. We just, as a whole, need to think a bit more before we make decisions because it's just, it's easy to just, you know, buy something without thinking about it too hard. So yeah, with, with some tools in place to make that easier and making, making those thinking decisions faster, like that app that you were saying, Scott, I think that's like super helpful. I didn't even know about that, but yeah, just like having all these tools available to us so that we can make more informed decisions. I think that would help a lot. Absolutely. And that reminded me of another statistic that the film quoted, which is that around the globe, $35 billion of subsidy go into the fishing industry every single year. And the UN estimates that it only takes $30 billion to solve world hunger. So effectively, we if we redirected this, this capital into solving world hunger, we would have solved global famine by now. But instead, mm -hmm. we choose to use that money to subsidize the fishing industry, right? And this is like, you know, and, and not to mention all the problems, the, the aforementioned problems with this fishing industry, with slavery, you know, with illegal fishing, with trawling and, you know, marine ecosystem destruction and all these things. So I'm just wondering, like, why? If, if the math is so clear, why are we still continuing to eat fish? And then to your point is because there is no alternative. So then now the answer is clear. We need more entrepreneurs who and investors, right? Like venture capitals who have the funding to invest in plant-based seafood alternatives. And I think Scott brought up a really good point, which is that the ocean is one of the most resilient ecosystems on the planet. So if we can sort of save the oceans first, then I, I guess that will hopefully percolate through you know, life on land as well. And everything else will start to rebound because I, I feel like life on land is directly tied to the livelihood of the oceans, right? If the oceans were to die off, we are not that far off from extinction. Yeah, it would be devastating to, to lose the biodiversity. And I think thinking from a systems perspective, at least in a globalized system like the one that we live in, it starts with public awareness. Mm -hmm. That's just the very first step. And then you start to see change. And policymakers are only going to listen to the constituents that, that tell them that they care about something. I think this is probably the most impactful thing from this film. It, it was a wake-up call for a lot of people. Right. And that's really just the first step. 
I mean, we're like 20 years behind where the, the land animal meat conversation is. God, like all these conversations need to happen at the same time, you know, with land and seafood. Why not just go vegan, which is what I am, which is what Alicia is. And I mean, <laughs> we're practically have, like all three of us are practically vegan. And I think plan based is the future, as I've emphasized, like my podcast is called Make Peace Not Beef. It doesn't get more obvious than that, but I'm, I'm not just doing it to be preachy. I'm doing it for a speaking from a very realistic and scientific standpoint, our planet literally cannot sustain the way we go about consuming meat and seafood and dairy. So yeah, absolutely. This movie is a wake up call, but are we really surprised to be honest? Like, (laughs) you know, and actually the the surprise part is a point that I'd like to touch on because that was one of the bits that was a highlight of the film. Uh, the, the filmmaker Ali, he's surprised at things and mm-hmm. you see you see it from his perspective yes. and you feel surprised. I think some of the things that he was surprised at were things that I'm surprised he didn't know about. <laughs> like what? And it, and it just kind of, it, it kind of impacted my enjoyment of the film, seeing him just discover things. Like one of the things that he's just like the very beginning and it's really just around plastic pollution uh, because I'm an expert in that. And so I've been following this issue of plastic pollution since like 2013. And I think when he started making the film, it was like 2015 or 16 or so. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was talking about plastic islands of plastic and straws and things as if it was the first time he'd ever heard of the issue. And to me that that was sort of like a red flag, like, where have you been? (laughs) <laughs> like this conversation has been happening. Um, yeah. It's cool. Thank you for coming. It's Scott, um, but Scott, he does really not happy have to have you. <laughs> no, but, but I think it's been in the public eye for a long time. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was just coming to it, it's fine. But, you know, everyone is where they are and that is absolutely fine. But he was presenting it as if people were keeping the information from him and particularly his criticism of the plastic pollution coalition, where basically he said, why aren't you talking about fishing gear? And they're like, we do, and they have, and they, we, the, the fishing gear has been a highlight of the plastic pollution research since the very beginning. It was one of the things that we first complained about as scientists back in 1988. That's why we had international treaty to, to discuss it. And his comment about like, why are we, why do we care about straws? I was like, mm-hmm. okay, also welcome. Thanks. Glad you care about straws now. Um, that's just the entry. Now, now that you care about straws, now you can care about all of the other plastic things. Uh, and we're not in the Plastic Pollution Coalition and other researchers are not just focused on straws. Nobody is just focused on straws. It's, it was literally just a tactic to get people interested in the issue. And it's something that you can do that's visible. Right. So I get your argument. However, I would like to refute that. You know, you are someone from the science scientific community, right? You are a research scientist. So of course, you're very well versed on this topic. But I think Ali represents most of us, the general public. So even if, if the filmmaker did not know about this, what does that speak about? Like, what does that speak to the general public, right? Who yeah. are even less aware of the situation? Like, that's actually scary. If, if someone as knowledgeable as him was surprised to discover islands of plastic, what does that say about the general public who's blindlessly consuming meat and seafood? That's So I, I think you brought up a really good point, which is highlighting the issue of lack of communication around the matter, uh, the matter and not enough messaging. Right. And of course, you've done a whole PhD on it. So you're more than well aware and and you're extremely qualified to talk about this. But that really worries me because I'm like, shit, if the filmmaker had discovered this for the first time and, you know, you were shocked. What about everybody else who's eating fish filet, like filet of fish at McDonald's? They probably don't even think twice. (laughs) Yeah. And there's certainly a lot of people that still are unaware of the plastic pollution issue. But I think people have been more or less aware of it and it's been it's been part of the conversation in the media since about 2012 or 2013 that's really when it started to get a lot of publicity and i'm curious actually since you two are didn't do a phd in plastic pollution when when can you remember was your first exposure to the plastic islands or whatever Mm. probably in my adulthood i don't think in my childhood i really thought about it like I grew up on like a small farmette. We had like chickens and turkeys and like we had our own garden. We did go to the grocery store and like I saw, you know, things wrapped in plastic, but it just seemed like a lot of our food was was sourced from the land. So I yeah, and growing up in that type of cornfield <laughs> farm environment, there just wasn't like trash around. Like 
in the streets or anything. But then, yeah, when I was 21, I moved to the city of Chicago and then just saw like trash everywhere (laughs) and like alleys and just, you know, piling up. And I kind of started to think about it a bit more, but it wasn't until maybe I traveled internationally. And when I went to Africa and they had banned plastic bags, like even like Ziploc bags, you couldn't like bring them with you. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was in South Africa and in Tanzania. So yeah, that was all like really shocking. Like, wow, like there's like a really big problem. And yeah, like going to, going to Africa really like opened my eyes to just seeing the trash piled up and how they took care of it was with burning it. And the smell of burning plastic is mm. so awful and so bad for your lungs and for your health. But that's just what <clears throat> they did. So or what, what, the, what they do even today, even in, in Puerto Rico, I go to Puerto Rico and I drive around to the mountains where my grandma lives and there's just piles of trash that are just burning. So yeah, I guess like in America, I haven't noticed the, the problem as, as bad, or I haven't been like face to face with it. But when I've traveled to Puerto Rico or Africa and I see them burning plastic and I see it just like everywhere, that is very like eye-opening. You know why? Because America is a quote-unquote developed nation. So you are shielded from all of these. Yep. They, they dump all these us. industrial yeah. waste in like Louisiana Cancer mm-hmm. Alley, probably, right? Where yeah. mm-hmm. um, impoverished African-American <laughs> populations live away yeah. from the wealthy community. You don't see it, but whereas in Africa or parts of Africa or South America, uh, the, you, there is no such distinction between the rich and the poor. And so you see all of it happening. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the U.S. sends 1 million metric tons of plastic pollution oh, to God. countries out every year and you know recently china stopped uh accepting imports from the states because yeah usually uh, america for those for americans for american listeners who did not know yes the u.s exports plastic waste to countries like china every year and recently china has declined <laughs> so mm-hmm. which is good because it forces america to, in- to innovate but of course the problem is not just you know exclusive to america obviously every country produces a huge amount of plastic which makes me feel so good because on a previous episode i interviewed um this seaweed entrepreneur she's starting a seaweed venture and she's uh, venturing into um seaweed bioplastic as an alternative to plastic and i feel so proud mm-hmm. that to have interviewed her so you should go back and listen to that episode if you haven't <laughs> but i want to ask scott a dumb question actually so why is that there's so much plastic in the ocean versus on land like in land i think there's a lot more plastic pollution on on land probably by an order of a hundred or a thousand times more uh, it's a very, very small portion of plastic that enters the ocean that's produced globally. It's less than one. It's less than one percent for sure. The vast majority of plastic is sequestered somewhere on land. So whether that be in a landfill that is good or leaky, oh, um, mm-hmm. or incinerated, but very small, very small amount is actually actually leaks to land. But we produce an incredible amount of plastic. It, it's something like two hundred million metric tons every year globally. And so 1% of that is a really huge amount. Okay, well, so then let's talk about the solutions for a little bit because this conversation is getting depressing. So as an ecotoxicologist and a research scientist, what do you think is the most effective way for us to either A, reduce our plastic consumption or B, clean up the mess that we have created? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll reframe the question perhaps as what can we do that is most impactful? Because I think cleaning up plastic in the environment is not feasible. It will never be economically feasible. How do you clean it up? Mm -hmm. You can't. You can't you can't take it out. One, it breaks into very small pieces that you 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 can't take out of the water once it's in there right. or the soil or really anywhere at least below a certain size. But really, reduction has to be our goal. We can make personal goals to reduce our consumption, especially if we have the means and if we well, that's just one of the things that we can do. The other major thing that we can do is support the companies that don't use plastic or have made reduction goals or innovations to replace their plastic with with things that are either reusable, compostable, or uh, fully biodegradable. And we can also pressure our policymakers to do something meaningful about it. But I think if we just focus on like putting things in the right bin, recycling, we're not doing really anything at all. Um, yeah. A lot of the recycling, the things that we put in the recycling, doesn't go to recycling exactly Um, uh, nearly nearly all of it in some places goes to landfill because we we can't send it we we can't send it to china anymore 
We don't have uh, domestic infrastructure. You know, I'm kind of glad that the U.S. can't just ship off its plastic waste to China anymore. Not just because I'm Chinese Canadian, I am, but it has nothing to do with that. (laughs) Well, first of all, as you know, my Chinese ancestors are like, no, we don't want this in China. But also because this forces America to evolve as a nation, because now you can't just Mm -hmm. ship off your garbage to some faraway country that you can't see. Now you have to live with the garbage. That's where the innovation comes in, right? Because desperate times call for desperate measures, and that that's what forces entrepreneurs like shit. Now what now we have to live in our own waste. Okay, well, maybe it's time that we stop producing all this waste. Yeah. It's so. a, a good tactic to hold us accountable for what we're doing, as opposed to just being like, oh, we'll just send it over there. So absolutely. So I feel like climate change is a huge opportunity, right? Like for us to evolve mm-hmm. to civilization. I said this a million times, you know, for us to learning to cooperate, uh, you know, between the nations for the very first time. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then also um, cha- really reconsider the way we model the world and, you know, the economy and also just how, how we go about living and extracting resources from this planet. So Scott, I guess, since you're an expert in this area, um, what are some viable alternatives to plastic? Would you say that that can be mass produced in, in a reasonable within a reasonable timeline to be able to solve this crisis? So we already have the, uh, the alternatives. We've had the alternatives since for many products before plastic was ever invented. If you have great grandparents around, you can ask them about the milkman. Uh, glass, glass stars. Glass right. is uh, uh-huh. infinitely reusable if you make it hardy enough. And Europe already does that. All of their beer bottles are exactly the same. They're thick and they can be reused uh, many, many times. When you go to a bar in Europe, many places, you put down a deposit for that bottle that you're about to drink. And they'll Mm -hmm. give you the deposit back when you give them back the bottle, like right there. For food eatery, we've always had reusable things like ceramics. But a lot of countries that now use plastic, like African countries, have long had materials that are fully sustainable uh, palm leaves like banana leaves those are still used in many places in the world bamboo materials that can be grown rapidly it doesn't have to be paper paper is just one of the things that we can grow but we can grow other types of materials much much faster that use less resources but there's a lot of there's a lot of products that you're wondering how do we make a plastic water bottle out of b- bamboo That doesn't seem like something that can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And the need for these products in our lives, they already exist. We're not going to just go back to the way it was. That's not how things have tended to go very well uh, when we we attempt that, right? So bioplastics uh, is a potential alternative that could be viable. The issue around bioplastics, there's, there's, there's two main issues. Well, three, perhaps. The goal of bioplastics is build it or grow it, make it into the product, send it back to the farm, turn it into compost, mm-hmm. grow it again. Sustainable. It's a loop, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Currently, the bioplastics that are on the market, like the ones that you might have seen that have the little PLA, symbol on the yeah. bottom, PLA, mm-hmm. a lot of times it does not compost. Yeah. That's um, it, it just like doesn't, why, it just doesn't break down. Does it um, need more heat a, or yeah. what commercial okay. composting facility yeah. to do that? It needs an mm-hmm. industrial composting facility. Mm-hmm. It's often too thick too. If they, if they use the really, really thin ones and they have the right conditions, they can decompose it, uh, compost it, uh, but often they can't. There are other bioplastics out there like PHA that seem to be much better at composting. And there's some actually that you can throw in your backyard compost and will decompose, wow. turn back to the soil. So it is possible. It's totally possible to have fully compostable materials that have all the properties of conventional oil-based plastic. The other two considerations that I want to highlight is the chemicals that go into those sometimes are exactly the same toxic chemicals that we find in conventional oil-based plastic. That's just a regulation Mm -hmm. issue. The third is the sustainability of the resources used to grow those crops. So if we're, if we're just using corn to to build or to, to grow these products, we might likely consume all of the resources that we have for, for soil nutrients in the Midwest within the next 20 years. We are completely over extracting to make corn. I think that's a food security issue. Like, are we, are we, we were sacrificing what could be food for now is a product that is disposable and not the resources are not being fully sustained. So there's a lot of nuance around like just replacing with bioplastic. Mm. 
Yeah, and I guess we really it comes down to changing the way that we live and start reusing things instead of like Reusing. creating. Because mm-hmm. who the fuck invented plastic? I just I just Google this. It's a guy called Leo Bakeland, right? It was probably for convenience, and he invented mm-hmm. this back in uh, 1907. So plastic's been around for more than a century, oh. and we've developed a whole convenience culture around it. But like you said, our grandparents, you know, that's how they got milk. It was, it was through a glass, and you have to re- return it and then bring it back. So time to start cultivating. Maybe it's the time to revert to our primitive lifestyles. That's the only way to reverse climate change. You know? Let's yeah. go back to our caveman days. <laughs> no, unlikely. But I, th- I think I think you're absolutely right. Time to put pressure on these corporations to stop. Maybe the, the best thing we can do is just to stop buying products that c- come with so much plastic. You know, as a way of boycotting it. Like for me, I bring my own water bottle everywhere, and nowadays, like even my own food container, I try not to um, order takeout. Because I know it's mm-hmm. that, sh- that stuff is going to end up on a lo- ocean somewhere. And I feel guilty for knowing that that's where that thing is going to go. What, what about you two? What do you do in your day-to-day life to reduce plastic? Yeah, I mostly just have you know, like a water bottle with me wherever I go. Um, I have like a metal straw that's like on my keychain. Nice. So when I go out I, and I need a straw, I can use that. And then, yeah, bringing bags for like produce at the grocery store. So I'm not buying produce that's wrapped in plastic. I'm buying mm. produce that I just throw in like my little bag. And yeah, I guess just like, I think we talked about this last time too, just like shopping in the outer aisles of the store. Like don't go in the in, uh. inside the rows as much because that's where everything is like super packaged. So yeah, I think that's been pretty effective for me, but yeah, I mean, it's, it still feels, I guess, impossible to eradicate plastic out of my Mm -hmm. everyday life. Like I'm going to eventually need to order something online and have it shipped and it's going to come in plastic. And like, I have a backpack and that the zippers have plastic on them. And, you know, it's like, it's just, it's, it's in everything. So yeah, I really wish we like would have thought <laughs> um, <laughs> more clearly and thoroughly before we just decided to put it in literally everything. Like I'm wearing contacts right now. I'm pretty sure those have plastic in them. Goddamn, George Carlin was right when he said humans were here for one purpose, which is to make plastic. But <laughs> I wish he <laughs> I wasn't heard that. so, yeah, he was dead on. Um, what about you, Scott? Well, uh, Alicia had some really great points she there. Did. She had uh, great really points. nailed it. Um, I'll just add one thing, which is Plastic Score is an app that, you can get from the app store that is like Yelp, but you rate the plastic usage for restaurants and Ooh, bars. Oh, I love and that. It's great. It's great. I've, I use it everywhere I go, but there's almost like no data yet. Like we just need more users. It, it was like just put out, but that's a great way that you can actually like hold businesses accountable in in a way that's, it, it's, it's more of a carrot than a stick, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Because it's like, yes, I really like this brewery because they like don't force straws upon me. Then other people can that are conscious about that as a habit, then they can go to the that bar again, right? Or- I always try and leave that uh, like on Yelp, but it's like there's no like category for it, right? Yeah, you know you what? Filter- That's you know what's even better is to integrate sustainability ratings into Yelp and Uber Eats. Right. Like, why haven't they thought about this yet? Which just goes to show you big tech really does not care about the planet <laughs> because if they did, it would have come up with this feature a long time ago. And I need to go bug. OK, shit. My roommate used to work at Uber and now she's jump ship. So I can't I can't pressure her to like lobby Uber. But maybe if we submit enough comments. Maybe if we submit um, enough comment letters to Yelp. I think so. And just start <laughs> signing a petition. Like, why isn't Yelp doing this? We need sustainability ratings. And I actually, like, propose mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I think I think we really need to. And Uber is, right? Just think about how many people ordered takeouts. Oh, my God. That's, that's mm-hmm. especially with the pandemic, that's contributing to yeah. so much plastic waste. So, listeners, if you can cook at home, learn how to cook. It's a survival skill. Like, I cook. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I think we should all learn how to cook. You know, geez, it's, it's the problem is really rooted in convenience culture. So I do want to ask each of you a question that I've been thinking about for a while. So if you think about it, the Western world is kind of moving toward a plant-based diet, you know, minimalism and zero waste lifestyles are trending, right? We're kind of like, there's a trend, you know, with downsizing. But the problem is, what about all the cities that are booming in Africa and in Asia and in Latin America that are about to follow our capitalist trajectory, developing nations who are on their way to become developed nations? And they said, you cannot keep us in energy poverty forever because we want to rise too, because we want to grow our economy too. So how can we make sure that this time around they bypass our mistakes and go straight into sustainable development because that's what I'm concerned. Think about Manila. Think about uh, Shanghai. Well, Shanghai has already reached that stage. Think about all the, like I don't know, Nairobi. You know, um, cities that are up and coming. 
as their population booms, how can we make sure that they don't follow the same trajectory that America and many parts of China, uh, all the world's biggest polluters are following? I guess it would be amazing if there was like some sort of like tax break or incentive for them to go down more renewable path so that they don't, you know, make a mistake and go down a bad path and then have to undo it <laughs> to go down the more renewable energy efficient way. But I mean, I do kind of see, so yeah, I, I've been to three different places in Africa, I've been to South Africa, Tanzania, and Morocco, and then um, I have family in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico does remind me of Africa in some ways too. I see a lot of solar panels in Puerto Rico and in Africa. I feel like a lot more than I've seen in my time Wait, throughout which the United part of Africa? States. You, you were in South Africa, were you? Cape Town? Yes. Um, I was not in Cape Town. I was um, doing uh, wildlife research in jo- near Johannesburg in Limpopo. Johannesburg. Johannesburg. Um, and yeah, I mean, they had, they lived pretty much like off the grid. Like they had solar panels. They had solar panels that charged your phones and like everything ran on on solar and they had a battery charger or a battery that they used um, as a backup when that went out they had a well in back like they like lived off of the grid so that was my time in 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 south africa and then when i was in morocco like driving towards the sahara there's like just solar panels (laughs) like a lot of them and i haven't seen a field of solar panels like that um, here in the United States. So mm. from just from my experience, I feel like they already are taking that approach. Damn. And in some ways it might be easier to do solar awesome. panels in areas where there's just so much sun. It's just, it's very abundant in Puerto Rico too. Like all the houses around my grandma's house, all have solar panels. And oh. yeah, I feel like it's, I, I've seen it more elsewhere than I have here. So I, I do think it is happening. So that's so good to hear that Africa is taking the lead on sustainable development. And I, I want to, he- that, that's a fantastic answer. And I also want to hear what Scott has to say. So I'll give a very specific example that I know a bit about. Last year, Kenya tried to ban single-use plastics. The United States did not take an official stance on it. However, the American Chemistry Council, which is the organization that represents the plastic producers, in the United States, they effectively coerced the United States into basically sending this, a statement to Kenya, like, you will not do this. You will not. Wait, ban, what? You will not ban single use plastic. It was, it was, it was quite coercive. And Kenya was, this was, this was really a, a sovereignty issue because um, this is a, an African country that is declaring for itself. We don't want this issue. We've already seen it play out in different countries. And the U.S. sees Kenya as, particular, particularly Kenya, as a pivotal piece in securing plastic economy in Africa. Uh, the U.S. produces a lot of plastic and we send it to Africa. We're just breaking into the market there as a country. And Kenya is, is where there's a lot of ports that come in. And so if we if we can if we can keep Kenya if, if the United States can keep Kenya as a country that will consume plastic and and distribute it to other African nations, then it will ensure that uh, that market. But if Kenya said no, we're 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 done with plastic, then that could actually a gate for the entire entry into the African economy for that. And it was really sad to see. Um, there was an article that was written in Forbes uh, magazine that was basically saying, well, these developing countries, they, they haven't had a chance to, to have the conveniences of coal and, and dirty energy and, and plastic and all these nasty chemicals that we've banned uh, that have given these other countries a leg up. And it's, it's our ethical duty to allow them to do these things, to, to, to use these things that we've benefited from. We shouldn't be putting our morals onto them saying, Absolutely. well, we, we, we already learned this lesson and um, now you should have already learned it by now. But I think it's an absolutely the, the opposite of the message that should be out there, which is that this is an opportunity to do it right. And mm-hmm. if we, what we should be doing is promoting the sustainability in Africa and other nations, other developing nations and providing incentives for them to use, to not make the same mistakes that developed nations have made, as opposed to the absolute worst thing that we can do, which is go and prevent them from trying to make those good decisions, which is what happened last year with that particular scenario. Oh, shit. That, that's horrible. And that's so evil that um, 
I did not know that. I thought I thought the U.S. only shipped off its garbage to China, and now China is closing. Oh, it's not garbage. It's not garbage. It's it's products. Oh so we're selling God. them. We're selling them the actual product. It's not in the conversation of where are we sending plastic products. We only care about where we're sending the waste, right? Because that seems yeah. unethical to send waste to another country. But right. what about sending a product to a country that doesn't have waste infrastructure? Is it not the same thing? Holy shit! I am just. I can't. I can't believe the U.S. is doing this. That is unacceptable. Yeah, the I fact that it knows know that what either. plastic does to our ecosystem and it's still, mm-hmm. it's trying to lobby policies in Kenya. It's highly ban- profitable for for the U.S. Well, this is exactly why Biden better stop subsidizing the oil and gas industry because plastic is directly tied to the p- petroleum industry, right? It's a yep. low density poly polyethylene so i am just i am just so in shock and sad to to hear that 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 the u.s is going above and beyond to lobby against the policy in kenya well i'm not surprised because you know like that's kind of just how politics works but that is disgusting yeah that's that's so disturbing i had i had no idea about that it's interesting to know also that like, kenya is like the the gateway <laughs> yeah, it can you know sway the entire nation to be like yes or no for africa i didn't necessarily know that either wait so you're saying Kenya is where America has a foothold in in Africa right now? Like one of the countries? I thought it was Uganda. Rwanda. Pro- for for transport of goods, it's a port, major port. A lot of uh, products pass through Kenya. Oh, shit. Oh, I am so disturbed by this piece of news. I think everywhere around the world, we should start banning plastic. Obviously, it's tough. Well, I hope California is going to take the lead on that. I believe California is, right? But I think we really need to accelerate the transition. And it's absolutely disgusting that, that America is trying to, once again, keep Africa under with this lobbying against this policy. And I, man, that's the other thing that's so tough. You know, America is such a... The world's superpower, you know, it has a say in policies everywhere around the world. And uh, this is such a tough issue to solve. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, oh, I was going to say, actually, regarding that, I was going to say developed nations that have already figured out a path to sustainability to, should share, like knowledge sharing is required with the mm-hmm. developing nations and in helping developing nations develop the correct infrastructure from day one so that they don't have to go through, you know, the trajectory, the failed trajectory that all these other developed nations in the Western world have gone through and which causes climate change. I think the first time around, like you said, Alicia, because there's so many uh, like solar panels in Morocco and so many wind turbines in Tunisia, like I think that's really great. But yeah, I, I think as these like African cities are starting to, you know, become more and more populated, I, I really hope that you know the federal and local governments really invest in sustainable development but the other thing is like if they don't have the correct knowledge and tools right how are they going to know so i feel like this is where i'm against colonialism but i believe in knowledge sharing and i think if if america and china and all these developed nations can you know pave the way for africa's sustainable development like why the fuck not sorry i'm swearing so much in this pocket in this episode but you know because i know many african countries are very resistant to foreign intervention but i'm like what if that intervention is is there to help Help you and guide your development and save you 10 years of pollution you know like mm-hmm. should you be resistant to that maybe that was a rhetorical question but because yeah, i feel yeah. like, i feel like climate change is the only issue in which we need to put aside like pride and politics and just focus on solving the problem you know it's not about oh i don't want foreign intervention or i don't need to take advice from white americans or or like you know developed western mm-hmm. world but what if what if there's genuine knowledge sharing there that can really save the planet and also save yeah. Africa as a continent and not just Africa, like also Latin America, Asia, you know, cities around the world that are rapidly developing. And I think that knowledge sharing component is difficult to get across to those nations. And I guess it's like another example from, I guess like my grandma in Puerto Rico, like I recently got her internet. She didn't have internet. She's never had internet. So just like information and getting that shared with other people, like if you don't have access to internet, how will you know or how, exactly. how you learn something you don't know already? Exactly. Um, so in those countries, like that's definitely still a problem. Access to the internet and knowledge oh my gosh. To, to digest, to learn, to, to build off of. So maybe we're just missing that as a primary block um, step, as a primary step to move forward is like legitimate access to knowledge in that way where we can share it with each other and it's not just you know from the government telling you to do this and then you do it but you don't have access to explore and learn about 
the rest of the world. Right, right. I totally agree with that. Imagine if parts of Latin America, Africa, Asia had access to this information. You know, they learn about sustainable development. They learn about climate change and learning about the rapid pace at which this crisis is unfolding. Yeah, maybe they're more incentivized to take action. But I do feel like the younger generation, especially with Gen Zers around the world, I do believe many parts of, you know, I believe most Africans probably have a mobile phone nowadays. You know, so same Mm -hmm. with Latin Americans. So they can learn about this. And so many actually climate activists are coming from these parts of the world right from the global south so i am hopeful but uh yeah that 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 policy was disturbing and gosh like i just hate that the climate change is always getting lost in geopolitics and uh, this really frustrates me i don't know what to say and it's funny because i'm going to be studying public policy next year (laughs) i don't think i could influence global policy that's a lot of pressure to put on myself (laughs) But man, I am also hopeful because I know the next generation of policymakers is going to be us. You know, it's not going to be Joe Biden. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I love Joe Biden. I think he's doing great things for America, but it's not going to be it's not going to be Donald Trump. It's not going to be these older folks. It's going to be us. And we're going to be living through climate change. So if we don't make the right policies, yeah, we're, we're driving our, our the human race to extinction. And along with many other species who had nothing to do with this crisis, but are suffering as a result of our actions. So that was a very, okay, this episode is getting very long. And near the end, like halfway, I got really pissed. As you can see, I heard about the whole thing, how America was trying to intervene with Kenya's policy to ban plastic. Yeah. Like, like I was genuinely really shocked by that. And mm-hmm. uh, I definitely want to read about that now. Like you definitely inspired me to like Google it and like look into it. It's something I, I guess I haven't really given much much thought of like the US as a producer to other countries. I I guess, yeah, I really just thought about like our waste. And yeah, I thought how, it was the other way around. You know, I thought China yeah. was producing the most plastic and mm-hmm. um, and shipping them to America, but I didn't know America was a plastic producer that was shipping its not pro- plastic products everywhere. Yeah. You mentioned Cancer Alley in Louisiana. That's where most of the plastic production facilities are in the United oh, States. Christ. Uh, whoever invented plastic, fuck this over. Oh, well, I think the guy who invented plastic did not think that it yeah. would be what it is today. You can't, you can't blame that. I guy can't blame him. In the He's early like, 1800s. Yeah. It's not me. I was just trying to make this like convenient thing, but you guys took it too far. Yeah. I, but we know exactly who's responsible. It's very Ooh. well documented. Ooh. There's just a very small number of people that. Are responsible. Well, I think, I mean, yes, bureaucrats and certainly some politicians, but primarily it's the oil industry that has duped yes. the politicians and the American public and the world into thinking oil that we can just industry. recycle yeah, our way out of middle all finger this. on a public podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh well there was a fantastic npr interview or a series last year that came out that was digging into the historical records that were was kept by some of the big uh, chemical companies dow and dupont at looking at disinformation campaigns they're highly targeted highly sophisticated disinformation campaigns around recycling back all the way back to the 1950s when they realized that hey the public doesn't want disposable plastic everywhere we need to come up with a way to fool them into thinking that this is sustainable and so they came up with recycling recycling was never meant to work they intended to not work because they knew that they didn't want to be responsible for it so they mm-hmm. they just put it on the governments to say, all right, you you handle it, and that's why globally nine percent of plastic has been recycled, yeah. ever nine percent, and realistically that's recycled once. So usually after something has been recycled once, it cannot be recycled again. Mm-hmm. That's typically how it works because it gets contaminated after you mm-hmm. recycle it. Mm-hmm. A lot of the polymer uh, it has so many other chemicals in it that it's not food safe. Probably got PCBs and other things that shouldn't be in food contact wear and or it's not usable anymore because it's just degraded as a product. So recycling was never meant to work and it never has worked. So we just need to drop that as a solution. Stop. I mean, it, it can it can maybe work but it shouldn't be our primary thing. Clearly not. Clearly not. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. I have a question for you, Scott. So listening to you talk about all this, man, like I feel like you have one of the most depressing and most stressful jobs on the planet because you, you literally learn about ecotoxicologists. So you know, the dark side of all of this. So like, how do you fall asleep at night? Is my question for you. (laughs) 
you take to bed with this all, all this information every single day how do you not suffer from insomnia or maybe you do in which case you should let me know what, uh, what kind of medications you're taking so that might help me <laughs> as well yoga and mindfulness are great um surfing and rock climbing and things keep me sane but honestly yeah. i i mean i i i feel like i have a much easier job than uh doctors and, and nurses especially now i mean there's so many other people out there that i feel like ha- deal with more traumatic things in their careers but i mean it is depressing and you can ask my my loved ones um you know how depressing it really is because I'm sort of immune to it because I just eat it, breathe and drink it all the time. But the folks around me that are just like, Scott, you don't have to talk about that. Like we're, yeah. we're kind of tired of hearing that for right now. I get like, depressed. Too much. You're, it's like, you're Oh yeah, talking? totally. Like other people don't eat, breathe and drink this all the time. So but, like, I have to you, remind you myself were, like, of that. You were like smiling the entire time during this podcast episode. I'm just so amazed by your level of optimism. Or maybe that's a defense mechanism at this point. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think like most ecotoxicologists, our genuine curiosity is the thing that keeps us going. Mm-hmm. That and caring and seeing that the things that we do have impact, I think is what makes it worth it. So tell me, how are you hoping to make an impact with the work that you do? Are you hoping to influence corporations and policymakers with your research papers? Absolutely. So right now, I'm leading the state of California's efforts on microplastics for not only what's in the ocean, but also for drinking water. And we will be conducting the first ever monitoring conducted by the, by any government anywhere in the world, uh, starting next year for microplastics and drinking water. Uh, And soon after we'll be looking in the marine environment. And once we start monitoring for it, then we can manage it. And once we figured out how much it actually costs to society to have it in our drinking water, to have it in our seafood, then we can actually bring the cost back to those that are responsible. Wow. And until we quantify those things, the legal system doesn't work. It's not set up like that. You have to prove right. that it is harming and that there's a problem without a shadow of a doubt before you can actually hold people accountable for it. It's unfortunately oh the system that exists, but that's that's the rules that we have to play by. Scott, you are the invisible hero saving the day. <laughs> Am I invisible? <laughs> well, you're not invisible. <laughs> well, you're visible, but most people don't understand the work of an ecotoxicologist and why your research is so important. Because like you said, mm-hmm. we live in a society where the burden of proof is on the complainant, right? So now you got to be like, okay, I got to go out of my way to research and to dig out the finding to show you that these companies are harming our ecosystem and, and the, the public health. So now we can go back and tax them and ask them to comply with regulations. So, uh, such important work. You are providing the evidence for this trial. <laughs> Polluters are innocent until proven guilty, just like any anyone else in the U.S. legal system. Even though we know that they're guilty. <laughs> and that's not the way it is in every country. In, in Europe, chemicals are guilty until proven innocent. You have to prove that they are not harmful before you can put them on the market. It's the opposite in the U.S. Wow. That's, you know, that's, that's the dark side of presumption of innocence because yeah. yeah i mean alicia go for it you haven't yeah that. i mean that's just like disturbing <laughs> so but it's like disturbing. the other way around like you have to get sick or like have issues until it's like taken off the market i think like bpa was like that right oh bpa is still everywhere yeah oh my god yeah it's it's just it's, the, it's banned from baby bottles that's it <laughs> basically everything else any anything yeah. that um uh anything that is made of a certain polymer, um, forgetting the name right now, but a lot of things contain BPA or an alternative that's just as worse. Jesus Christ. Wow, this was a very emotionally taxing and just mentally challenged. Like, I, I feel like this entire time, my mood was just going like this. Like, my mental state was just fluctuating up and down. Like, just hearing all the things that he had to say. This was a lot to take in. We started with Seaspiracy. We ended up, uh, we went through, like, Africa's, like, sustainable development in Africa. And then we ended up on plastics. And it's just like, uh. well, why don't we end it on a brighter note? Because I feel like our listeners just just crying in a corner. And I was like, no, I don't want to listen to Maybe He's Not Beef anymore. You're going gonna to see my listenership drop. It's like, this is the most depressing, oh, no. suicide-inducing podcast <laughs> in the world that's not the whole point i'm sorry listeners to put you through this but 
why don't we each end the podcast on a brighter note? So starting with Scott, because you started this. <laughs> no, actually, I started this. <laughs> you invited me. I know. You, I you started. Didn't know what you get into? <laughs> <laughs> I did not know what I was getting ourselves into. Yeah, I did not know this. I did not foresee. So um, let's talk about the solutions. Well, we already did, but let's mm-hmm. talk about. Okay, what are some reasons to be optimistic about this crisis? Well, I think this is an inflection point for a lot of these things: for climate change, plastic pollution. Uh, overfishing. We have an unprecedented opportunity to make change right now because of the widespread awareness, thanks in part to Netflix and and Instagram and TikTok and just rapid communication, but also great storytelling, like what we saw in story in Seaspiracy, uh, as well as all the many movies about plastic pollution and climate change. Mm-hmm. I think the one thing that we can do is to re- to hold our power and to, 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 to grab our power as citizens and not just throw it away. And it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to, to, to throw it away, to, to, to believe that we have no power, but every little drop counts and can make a, a tsunami. Uh, we can move, we can move mountains as a society. This is so inspiring. <laughs> yeah, I completely yeah agree with you, Scott. That sounds, yeah, like, it's it's in our hands we can do this like there are small steps that we can do every day that can add up and have a lot of impact and i really like your your story about like how um it's starting to like measure the microplastics in our drinking water or whatnot because like if you can't once you start measuring it then you can identify how bad the problem really is and then with data you can make a world of change kind of goes into like the devops principles like if you like you have to measure everything first and then you can start troubleshooting and monitoring and pinpoint where the problem is and that's just a principle that can be applied to like everything absolutely i totally agree with you i think data is just so important and then it becomes a shareable thing on instagram you know like one day scott study is going to be like an instagram post like 78 percent of plastic in the ocean blah, 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 blah. and people <laughs> can just like post that to their story so um and then that's how you raise awareness through numbers mm-hmm. because People remember that, right? Like I remembered, I'm going to remember for the rest of my life that 46% of plastic in the Great Pacific Patch comes from fishing gear and fishing nets. Like that's that's not going to leave my brain anytime soon. But then again, I have mm-hmm. superior memory retention and I'm not the average human, but that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point was I will keep reiterating this shit until I drill it into the head of all my listeners. But <laughs> yeah. that's really great, Scott. And yeah, Alicia, I think you both brought up such good points that this is an inflection point in our history and we can make this the this is our opportunities to really turn around and not just climate change it's like an awakening right and on all fronts hopefully this is this creates big enough for an incentive for us to really evolve and get to the next stage of our civilization because i feel like humans have been stagnant for quite a while now and now we're being Mm -hmm. pushed by this challenge we have to adapt it's challenging honestly but At least we're not going through this alone. I mean, we're going through this with like 7.7 billion other humans on the planet. That's how how I think about it. So it's like a collective challenge. It's kind of fun, right? It's like a collaborative challenge. That's the attitude. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, there we go. And and by the way, guys, I do not hate Americans, even though I shit on America so many times during this podcast. Alicia and Scott, you two are two of my favorite Americans because you're a part of this episode and we're trying to make a difference together. I mean, I'm Canadian. Let's be real. Canada is not that much better when it comes to polluting the planet. We're just as bad. You know, we're just north to America. We're we're as effectively America. America can annex us any day. So, (laughs) So, yeah, if you're Canadian don't feel too proud about your carbon footprint because it's not that far off from America. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We all need to do our part. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. another great way to reduce your plastic consumption is to cut seafood out of your diet because as Seaspiracy pointed out, fishing gear and fishing nets are a huge contributor to ocean plastics. So if you cut seafood out of it, then you are indirectly reducing ocean plastic. So way to recap the topic, but (laughs) full circle. Yep. Full circle. <laughs> and this, oh my gosh, we literally like went around the entire world and came back. <laughs> <laughs> literally. Yeah. I just want to thank you both, Alicia and Scott, so much for joining this episode. Um, any final remarks? Alicia, let's start with you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess like I've, like you were saying before, like you felt like a lot throughout this episode. Like I've been shocked at some of the statements that Scott has made. And it's kind of like how I felt like after watching Seaspiracy, like, wow, like I didn't know that. Um, like we can do better. Yeah. Like, there's, there's lots of things that we can do. And I think, yeah, if we start thinking more collectively and, you know, share our knowledge, we can really make a difference. Absolutely. 
And Scott? I'd say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That was my principal complaint with with uh, how Seaspiracy how Seaspiracy focused on plastic pollution. You know, basically throwing out one one issue uh, in favor of another, and mm-hmm. also dragging under the bus organizations that do really really good work, like the Plastic mm-hmm. Pollution Coalition. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need allies. We we yes. need to be finding the allies and supporting them, and not shaming those that aren't perfect. And just like other people in your lives, we can't shame them for not being perfect. We should applaud the, the, the few things that they do right. Because that's, I think, the only way that people are actually going to change. Yes, vegans, stop shaming vegetarians. Go after the meat eaters. <laughs> 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 that was always my philosophy. Stop shaming the vegetarians for not being vegan. They're already doing infinitely more than everybody else who's eating snake three times a day. And I, and I bet you there are Americans who eat steak three times a day. But yes, well, that, that was a long way of saying, you know, to Scott's point, yes, we need to applaud organizations that are doing anything to save the planet. Honestly, they're moving the dial. They're, 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 they are, at, you know, taking steps in the right direction. And we should applaud them in, you know, positive reinforcement, you know, classical mm-hmm. conditioning apply Freudian principles <laughs> and, and yeah, get people, to, yeah, yeah, encourage those positive behaviors. I agree. And I am hopeful because the younger generation, Gen Z, I've recently gotten to know some Gen Z entrepreneurs who are doing fantastic work. Uh, speaking of plastic, one of my future guests on the podcast is she's, she's a sustainability entrepreneur and she makes these reusable bubble tea cups, which as you know, is a huge issue within the Asian community because we drink so much bubble tea and all that shit is going to landfill. So she's trying to change that. And I'm just hopeful, like seeing all these young people, you know, I'm just feeling so inspired. So, and, and seeing both of you, like being so passionate about climate change just really makes me hopeful too. And Scott, thank you so much for, you know, educating us about policy, ecotoxicology. Like you've brought up so many amazing facts and stories that just completely stunned me. And Alicia, thank you so much for being such a passionate environmentalist and always sharing with us your passion and your knowledge and your experience, you know, working abroad in parts of Africa and Puerto Rico has just been so eye-opening. I'm just so fortunate to know both of you and thank you so much for your time on this podcast. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. It's been really fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been super fun. And I swore so many times. Uh, I hope, and please, listener, please do not flag my content as inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> well, if you do, then it's fine. But um, because you, you know I mean well. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate your support. Of course, listeners, I love you. You know, I love you more than anyone else in this world. Thank you for supporting my podcast. And please continue to support my podcast. And don't forget to hit that like, subscribe button, and comment down below. See, I'm, I memorized this. <laughs> Every YouTuber, <laughs> hashtag YouTuber essentials. Um, yeah, well, thank you for tuning in to Make Peace Not Beef episode 33 with Alicia Dale and Dr. Scott Coffin. And I'm not a doctor. I'm just Lily. So, uh, yeah, and I hope you learned something new today. And please go watch Seaspiracy if you haven't. It's a fantastic movie. Uh, it's, it's also a great thriller. <laughs> That's how I see it. Um, you're going to learn so much, and it's going to change your perspective, and you will be inspired to take action. Thank you so much, and I will see you in the next episode. Mm-hmm.